to everybody. Everybody who who should be there, the participants of the webinar are there, Clara? Yeah, everybody's there. I was just, you know, thinking whether we should. Uh... Let's start then. Let's start. Okay. Yeah. Let's start. Okay. So. Yes, just one minute. Oh, it's yeah. a, the time zone changed uh, in, in, in Europe now. We, we have now winter uh, time. Uh, so, okay. All right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're here for uh, yet one more uh, WCAA organized webinar. Um, this is our sixth WCAA webinar. Um, well, I said good afternoon, but it's good afternoon, good morning, good night, depending on your time zone, of course. My name is Clara Saraiva. I'm um, a member of the WCAA World Council of Anthropological Associations Organizing Committee, and I'm also the president of the Portuguese Anthropological Association. These webinars have been going on since April, basically since uh, confinement and the whole um, pandemia complications started. And um, we have been having these webinars uh, more or less, well, every month, uh, towards the end of the month, since April. You can all look at them in our WCA WOW website. They're all posted there. And as you know, WCA, the World Council of Anthropological Associations, is part of WOW, the World Anthropological Union, together with IUAES, the International Union of Anthropological and Ethnological Sciences. So first of all, I want to thank everyone, uh, first of all, to the participants who so kindly um, accepted to talk in this seminar, but also to everyone who is uh, listening and participating. This webinar will be recorded. So if you have something against it, you should write it on the chat. Um, the webinar will also afterwards be online in the next few days, as I said, in the WOW WCAA website. And I want to direct special thanks to, first of all, to the WCA organizing committee, especially our colleagues, uh, Virginia Dominguez and Carmen Real, the president, and uh, special thanks to Michelle Bouchard of University of Northern British Columbia, who also hosts uh, this, uh, technologically hosts this webinars, to Ricardo Faguaga from Mexico, who is in charge of communications and always helps us with Facebook, putting it on the website, etc. And to Silmara Takazaki from Brazil, who so kindly always makes both the save the date poster and the final poster. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you know is that, as I said, it's being recorded, but it's also being streamed online through Facebook. The participants today, we have five participants from five different countries, as always. We try to have the widest um, range of uh, countries and colleagues, uh, delegates from different associations coming into the seminars as participants. So today we will have Indonesia, Finland, Nigeria, Uruguay, and Palestine. All, all these countries have never uh, before participated in one webinar, so I welcome everyone. So from uh, Indonesia, I will now just briefly present our speakers and then I will pass the word to everyone. As I explained in the email I sent to the participants, we always follow uh, east to west uh, sense. So we start with the countries and the participants that are in the far east and going towards the west. In the case of our colleague from Palestine, because she's now based in the US, she will be the last one to to talk because she's in the westmost time zone. So as I said, uh, we have Indonesia, Finland, Nigeria, Uruguay, and Palestine. From Indonesia, we have our colleague Fajar Tufail, who is a researcher at the Research Center for Area Studies of the Indonesian Institute of Sciences and has been a revisiting researcher at Max Planck Institute, University of Ottingen, and University of Tokyo. He has published on the politics of indigeneity and the Adad movement in Indonesia. From Finland, we will have our colleague Rita Toivanen, who is a professor in indigenous studies um, at the University of Finland and uh, also at the Institute for Sustainability Science in Helsinki as well. She's vice director of the Center of Excellence in Law 
identity in European narratives funded by the Academy of Finland. From Nigeria, we will have our colleague Ogochukwo Ugwu, I hope I'm saying it the correct way, who's a professor at the Namadi Azikwe University, Auka, Nigeria. He is the IT officer of the Ethnological and Anthropological Society of Nigeria, and he has a very strong interest in blending anthropology to react to challenges of a changing world. From Uruguay, we'll have Christian Franopolo, Universidad de la República, Uruguay, and a member of the Uruguayan Association of Social and Cultural Anthropology. He researches on ayahuasca religions, syncretism and spirit possession, and biomedical health care for indigenous populations. Last but not least, we will have our colleague from Palestine, Sara Ihmud, who is a professor of anthropology at the College of the Holy Cross and a member of the Society of Palestinian Anthropologists. Her research in occupied Jerusalem focuses on militarization, state violence, and Palestinian feminist policies, politics. Sorry, pardon. She draws on the insights of Black, Indigenous, and third world feminists to understand intimate, embodied experience of racialized and gendered violence. So once again, I welcome all the participants. And uh, what we also did, which will also be posted on our website, we sent, besides the major theme of the webinar, which is uh, indigeneity and anthropology, we also sent a few questions, sub-themes, ideas, whatever you want to call it, that could more or less orient our discussion, our debate here today. Of course, the participants and the people who participate on the chat do not have to stick to these questions, but are just ideas. So the first one was, what is the situation in your country concerning indigenous populations? How do or do not people in general get involved in this issue? The second one is, does anthropology in your country largely mean fieldwork among indigenous people? And if so, is that controversial in your cycles? The third one, which is the relation of what happens in your country with the overall world situation of indigenous populations? And the fourth, if anthropologists in general were to adopt, adopt the practice of only studying indigenous people around the world, would you and your colleagues consider that problematic? If so, how and why? To finalize, I would like to ask people when they write on the chat, because we receive the questions from everyone who's listening basically through the chat. Uh, and I will then try to summarize it. And in the end, we will have some open discussion on this based on what is written on the chat. So please, everyone who writes on the chat, please mention your name if you wish, or at least the country you come from. So we have a, a register. We keep a record of everyone who was involved in the webinar. Thank you very much. And I will start now with the colleague from um, Indonesia, Fajar Tufail. I ask also everyone who is not speaking at the time to please um, unmute, to please mute yourself and then unmute when it's your time to, to talk so that it makes things um, easier. So um, Fajar, are you there? Cannot see you? Yes, yes, I'm okay. here. Uh, can I cannot see your photo? Can everyone? Okay, so, um, well, you have the floor. Uh, you're the first one. And once again, thank you very, very much for your commitment to WCA and for, for, for your participation. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Clara. Uh, I hope that uh, you can hear me and can see me perfectly. Yes. Oh, okay. I, yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, and good evening, uh, everybody. It's uh, already eight, 8 o'clock in the evening in Indonesia, so I should say good evening and then good morning, good afternoon for, to everybody. And again, thank, thank you, Clara, very much uh, for the invitation. And it is an honor for me to get a chance uh, to take part in this kind of uh, this uh, very important discussion and dialogue. And um, I will uh, kind of begin uh, to uh, not directly address your questions, uh, but kind of uh, uh, begin by describing uh, how the concept of indigeneity enters the anthropological vocabulary in Indonesia. And I think that this kind of uh, tracing back of this uh, genealogical history is very important uh, to understand how Indonesian anthropology uh, studies indigenous people and how it may kind of uh, tell us something about the changes that have uh, happened 
with regard to the shifting position of anthropologists uh, have uh, toward the indigenous communities in Indonesia. So I think this is kind of a, the way how I uh, structure my um, uh, contribution. So the term indigeneity uh, in Indonesian anthropological work can have uh, different meanings. And in fact, the terms of uh, indigenous community or indigenous group can be translated in a, in a uh, various different ways into Indonesian language. And the different translations uh, reflect not only conceptual changes on anthropological concepts, but also changes of political context and relation someone among ethnic uh, communities in, in Indonesia. So let me talk a little bit about some uh, complexities in the relation between Indonesian anthropologists uh, and ethnic groups. And for the moment, I will not use the term of uh, indigenous uh, community for the reason that I will describe uh, below. So uh, the uh, first complexity that uh, dealing with these uh, political structures and positionality, as you might know, Indonesia was under an authoritarian regime for 32 years. Uh, and this is kind of a produce a kind of a developmentalist ideology. And this, the state at the time held a very uh, tight political control of civil society. So, and then during this period, the majority of Indonesian anthropologists work as uh, at a state control uh, educational institution or government uh, bureaucracy. And this kind of uh, thing uh, influenced how this state anthropologists, uh, along with other social scientists, invented the category of uh, what we call the masyarakat racing or isolated people, and use that, this uh, term to refer to ethnic communities and who live in remote areas and subject to the state uh, civilizing project. So this kind of uh, first category uh, also uh, accompanied by, by other category, which, which is the, the pribumi. Uh, pribumi is translated as native, pe native people to refer to people who were descended from the so-called um, original inhabitants of the country as opposed to those who to those who said to have come from uh, outside uh, of the country such as the Chinese so I think I should like should highlight here that the anthropological notion of indigeneity in Indonesia places the, this kind of a two categories under the same category of indigenous people so and uh, and but we have a different kind of a translation in, into Indonesian uh, language so this kind of a uh, uh, kind of ambiguity between translation and, and, and the concept of uh, indigeneity, uh, it's something that was uh, kind of uh, becoming part and parcel of anthropological work in Indonesia. So the other uh, complexity dealing with the majority and minority, and uh, as you know, there are hundreds of ethnic groups in Indonesia. And then um, the terms, uh, the politics of uh, identity actually has become a major factor in the contestation of who should be considered as orang asli, or uh, 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 I use uh, the term here to refer to indigenous people. Orang asli actually literally means original or native people. Among those kind of uh, hundreds of ethnic groups, the Japanese is the biggest group, comprising more of, of more than 50% of the Indonesian population. So I think uh, over the last decade, uh, the politics of ethnicity in Indonesia has centered on the questions over who has the right to be called orang asli. Non-Javanese people usually claim, uh, those people who live outside of Java usually claim that the Japanese should not be called indigenous people. And their argument is that the Japanese uh, culture is actually not indigenous or, 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 or originated asli because it has been mostly influenced by the Hindu, Buddhist, and Islamic traditions. And uh, as such, it, 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 uh, the people say that it belongs to the great traditions. So the label, uh, label of, of orang asli or indigenous community should be applied to ethnic group that can trace their culture to the original ancestors of the ethnic group. So this is the, 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 uh, what is going on and what is becoming the center of the politics of ethnic uh, uh, identity in Indonesia until now. So let me uh, reiterate uh, my, 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 my major points. First, there are various translation of the term of indigeneity in Indonesia. They reflect how the state see ethnic groups and how the ethnic groups see each other. Some anthropologists follow the state's definition of isolated people, but recently anthropologists have been more involved in advocating ethnic rights and ethnic identities. However, both positions 
uh, I think it shows that they show that in taking part, uh, they they've taken part in the reproduction of ethnic politics, and in in that way, Indonesian uh, anthropologists at the moment, I will I will you know I will kind of argue that they have become become uh, less reflexive to the risk of kind of essentializing culture. And the second point uh, that I would like to raise here is that uh, indigeneity is actually a new concept among Indonesian anthropologists. And it became popular in the early uh, 2000, only after the authoritarian regime collapsed and when people are free to talk and express their opinions. It was also the time when Indonesia was more kind of a more or less uh, open to the international network of ethnic rights advocacy movement. So this is the the, the point that uh, on the, the the kind of uh, things that I would like to uh, bring up uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Clara. Thank you very much, uh, Fajar. For your contribution, we will now go to our next um, participant, Reta Toivonen. But I, we have a problem. I don't see her here online. This is very strange. Reta, are you there? No. Um, Reta Toivonen, are you there? Okay, um, I think our colleague is not there. I don't know what happened. So we'll move on to the next uh, participant from Nigeria, Ugo Chukwo Ugu. I hope I'm saying it correctly. And uh, once again, thank you very much for your participation. No. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. I'm actually delighted to. We, we, we cannot see you. Can you switch on your video? Is it possible? Okay. Uh, I don't know what is happening to the video. I've been trying to set the video. But then, I don't know. The video, the video is muted. I don't know. You, you 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 normally need to click on you know where on the bottom where it has the sound in the video. You need. Yes, to I have. I have done that. But uh, okay, let me do that again. Mm -hmm. Okay. If if it doesn't work, don't worry. Just. Um... Would have uh, preferred that it works. <laughs> Okay, please uh, thank you once again for having me. I am actually delighted to uh, be in this uh, meeting. Um, for the question, yes, I would say that uh, there is uh, indigenous population claims uh, in uh, Nigeria. But before I I start uh, discussing this. I may want to look at some explanations, you know, of uh, how indigeneity is conceived generally. And uh, one of those view is uh, from primordial view, you know, uh, which presents some diacritics of uh, a culture uh, that may uh, be the criteria for belonging to a particular indigenous group and uh, this plays out in the form of language um, religion and other features which may be racial indeed but uh, there are uh, there is also the instrumentalist ideology uh, that has uh, come to say that uh, indigeneity may be used for just few or political elites for their political uh, gains as, uh, as such. So the concept of uh, indigeneity emanates 
only from uh, that perspective. However, uh, there are uh, others who believe that it's a concept that is uh, under uh, uh, transformation. You know, indigeneity is not as static as one ought to, to see it. It fizzles, it uh, also uh, uh, continues to change. So having established uh, this background, um, I would say that indigeneity plays out in my country, but in a very strange way. Strange way. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, cases of uh, the Niger Delta, and then also the IPOB, and so on. Even IPOB, uh, for example, was able to build a uh, build, uh, uh, indigeneity into his uh, name, which is an uh, indigenous uh, people of uh, Biafra, okay? So, but all these are as a result of uh, resurgence of micro-nationalism. Uh, this is a phenomenon that is coming up as a result of reconfiguration of the so-called modern administrative uh, unit and uh, globalization. Uh, the early anthropology did not encounter this kind of uh, phenomenon because people were self-contained in the traditional practices, not necessarily touched by what modern uh, Western-style government brought. For instance, uh, the Afipo, uh, Lele, and even Afia and so on, we are studied without the disturbances that the Western style multi ethnic government brought in. But recently, uh, for reasons that uh, transcend the uh, uh, culture per se, and reasons that uh, pertain to politics as such, people started promoting this kind of uh, nationalism that is anchored on their definition of uh, indigeneity. And that is the kind of thing happening in Niger Delta. Uh, they say that this is our land. The central government is exploiting it to serve the needs of the rest of the country. So the resources should be left for, for them because they are the owners of the land. And uh, that they long occupied the area, uh, which implication is uh, the definition of indigeneity. Uh, in Ogoni, uh, which is also part of uh, Niger Delta, the issue is the same. Though they are the Niger, they, uh, they are in Niger Delta geopolitically. Um, when they campaign, they are looking at uh, the rest of. Uh, they are looking at uh, uh, only uh, themselves as a freestanding and focusing on uh, the Ogoni itself. Uh, this boils down to the control of natural. Uh, resources uh, at that uh, place. They say leave it for us. We want to organize the modern way Western style uh, government of our own. Indeed, we want to be dependent and this entity will be defined by those who belong or those who are outside uh, our ethnic uh, uh, cycles. Um, uh, in the case of uh, indigenous people of Biafra, it, the, the, the thing came uh, lately, I think that was around uh, 1967, uh, after uh, an attempt uh, for the people of uh, South, uh, uh, sorry, Eastern Nigeria uh, to secede from the whole of uh, the Nigeria. Okay, and uh, that uh, particular agitation uh, brought uh, about uh, Biafra. Uh, and as such, uh, the issue of Biafra is even more complex than we uh, look at it. Uh, for instance, uh, if you look at uh, the ethnic groups that make up uh, the space the pro or the Biafra agitators are claiming, you find that uh, you will not have less than 100 
ethnic uh, groups among these uh, uh, these people and even you know the contestation has also uh, been so serious because of the the border they are claiming okay you know they stretch uh, hand more or less down to middle northern and then also uh, those areas that uh, border uh, atlantic uh, ocean uh, but most of the actors as we may understand is uh, more or less political and uh, the search for uh, resource uh, control i think uh, i will hold it on here uh having established uh, my own footing thank you thank you very much um ugu uh some people as you can see in the chat have been writing on the chat some questions comments we will handle those at the end i will now give the word to our colleague from finland Heita Toivonen, and i apologize because uh I think that when we send out uh, the, the news with the time zone, uh, we didn't know that probably Finland was going to switch to inter time zone. I don't know how it happened, but it is indeed um, 1 p.m. UTC, which is 3 p.m. Finland and not 4. So um, I hope Rita is there now. Are you there? Rita? Hello, uh, Reita Toivana. Hi, welcome. Hi. Uh, hi, welcome. I just apologize because it seems there has been a, a little misunderstanding here with the time zone, so I apologize on our behalf. Um, yeah. Well, just we started exactly at uh, 1 p.m. UTC, and um, we have had, uh, as I explained it all in the beginning, but since you were not there, we have five colleagues participating, which you also saw from my previous mails, and our colleague from Indonesia, Fajar Tufail, and our colleague from Nigeria, Ugchuku Ugu, have already spoken. And I will give you the floor now since um, we were supposed you know, to be on an east to west uh, direction. Yes. So, um, so, well, it's your turn to talk. It's not a problem at all, don't worry. And I apologize, yeah. it's very informal. This is a discussion among colleagues and uh, once again, thank you very, very much for your participation in this. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really thrilled to be part of this and, and sorry that we had the time confusion that it's, uh, we have changed to winter time. So it's, uh, yeah, anyway, so I'm Reta Toivonen and I'm here at the University of Helsinki, professor of sustainability science. And my speciality is indigenous sustainabilities. And ever since I started uh, two and a half years ago in this job, I've been thinking about what these two concepts actually mean, the indigenous and the sustainability, both very difficult ones. And, and I like it that in the chat, there is already a lively discussion about what we say or what we mean when we use these, these words. And of course, when we don't speak in English, we use very many different versions of, of how the concept of indigenous is translated to the local, local and uh, national languages. So um, my, my talk would be a bit on the Sami people that live here in the northern. Sorry? Ah, oh, so somebody had a micro on. Uh, so I'm going to talk about Sami people and some people live in four countries here in the in the European North, in northern Norway, northern Sweden, northern Finland, and in in Russia. And um, of course, they don't only live in the northern parts of the countries, but they also live in all the cities and the capital cities. Uh, I suppose the biggest Sami communities today, because uh, because of the work opportunities that big cities uh, offer. So the first question was about the general situation in my country with the indigenous Sami people. 
And uh, there are many positive signs here uh, that have taken place since the beginning of the 90s, 1990s, uh, meaning that uh, we have more and more education in Sami languages. There are three different Sami languages spoken in Finland. And, and two of them are really very much endangered languages. But we have now children who are learning in the school and kindergarten in these languages and becoming uh, fluent users of those, those languages. So in the kind of language front, uh, situation would be very positive. There is a new uh, program that offers also kind of uh, online teaching for the children so that your uh, right to learn your own mother tongue would not anymore depend on the place where you live, but you could from any school participate in that education. But at the same time, when there are these kind of positive signs that deal basically with language and culture, uh, politically we have uh, many problematic areas and this has to do with a certain extractivist mindset that is uh, located in the heads of Finnish business people and European business people and, uh, and uh, authorities, meaning that this area where Sami people traditionally live is very rich in minerals. And, um, and there is a lot of kind of uh, mining interest toward, towards the Sami home territories. Uh, the home territory is uh, by law protected, that there is not possible to have a mine, but every now and then there still is a kind of initiative that tries to push that border and, and, uh, and with that there is a kind of constant sign to the indigenous peoples that they write to their land or they write to decide on this kind of things is somehow less worthy than it would be from the majority society. There is also a big plan that is connected to China and Chinese uh, money, so to say, and that would be a kind of Arctic railroad that would be planned to go through the whole Finland to northern Norway, which would mean that that railroad would cross the reindeer herding areas and would, of course, cause a lot of uh, economic and cultural disasters if that would really become a, a, a project that would be carried out. So, uh, so concluding, it's, uh, there is positive and negative signs at the same time uh, ongoing. Uh, so in anthropology, we have quite a few anthropologists working with the Sami people, but I would say that the most of the Finnish researchers who do indigenous studies and uh, anthropologists who do indigenous studies study indigenous people in Indonesia and in Latin America and in the US and very far away. So I don't have many anthropology colleagues who are working in the Arctic with the, with the Sami people. And um, there are a few, uh, there are controversial issues, of course, and I think anthropology is a discipline that is very much been developing uh, in the last decades in, in order to understand the importance of kind of core creation of research so that indigenous peoples are not the kind of research objects, but we do a lot of collaboration and that collaboration and doing together, that's a kind of, uh, the most, I would say, ethical method that anthropology has to offer for indigenous studies in, in general. Um, so uh, there was the question about the my country and world situation of indigenous populations, I would say peoples, but uh, indigenous peoples of, of uh, the north, uh, northern Europe, uh, the Sami people are very from the beginning of the indigenous global movement, they have been very active themselves in participating, being even the chair of the indigenous permanent forum. And, um, and they have made, uh, I think they have made a big role in creating the UN structure. So uh, I would say the global connection between indigenous peoples is very strong. And it's only very good if we anthropologists working on indigenous issues would also 
have more places and spaces to discuss these things together and uh, and that would be something that we are doing now here and i'm really happy about this opportunity so thank you very much for giving me the floor thanks Thank you very much, Rita. Um, I had in the beginning introduced everyone, so I did introduce you too. <laughs> and once again, I apologize that you weren't there, but anyway, it, that's fixed. So, so thank you for your contribution. We'll move on now to our colleague from Uruguay, uh, Christian Frenopolo. Christian, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Hello, welcome. I will unmute uh, myself and give you the word. And, and just before uh, giving the word to Christian, I just want to make a, a short remark that I could have done in the beginning, but I basically forgot, which is we have these five countries here. And as you know, uh, and you can see on the WCA website, all the webinars have had contributions from different countries, so different colleagues from different countries. And of course, we are totally aware that this issue, this theme, of anthropology and indigeneity is very wide and there are many, many countries in the world where such questions are very uh, important. And, you know, as Brazil, as Australia, as many others. The thing is we cannot have everybody at the same time. And, and so we do try to move from country to country and have a wide representation in these webinars. So this time, we chose, we contacted the colleagues from these countries that we thought were also very important countries uh, where people do discuss and, um, you know, are aware of, 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 the, of the importance, the vital importance of the theme. But of course, I just want to stress, this is a vital theme for all of us as anthropologists. So a wide uh, interest theme to be discussed within the WCA forums. So. Please, Christian, thank you very much. Muchas gracias, and I give you the word. Okay, um, so hello everybody. Thank you um, to the people who invited me to participate. I'm, I, I agree with, Cla with um, Maria Clara that this is a very important um, topic for pretty much every nation. Um, in the case of Uruguay, I'm very happy that Uruguay was invited to give an opinion because it's very unique because nobody can agree there's no agreement about whether there is an indigenous population in Uruguay. So you'd think this is a kind of straightforward thing, either there is or there isn't, because nobody doubts this in Brazil, nobody doubts this in Bolivia, nobody doubts this in, in Colombia. The rest of South America, nobody has a doubt that there's an indigenous population, but in Uruguay, there's no agreement. So I'm gonna try and answer the, the, some of the questions and try and explain historically why even anthropologists can't agree on whether there is or there isn't an indigenous population in Uruguay. <clears throat> so firstly, uh, the state does not recognize an indigenous population. So any people who may have descended from the native inhabitants um, do not have any kind of official recognition. Um, there's no kind of reparation. There's no historical um, addressing the issue. Um, and there's a very strong narrative that intends to give the idea and convince people that there is no indigenous population and therefore the topic isn't even worth bringing up. It's not something that you should even talk about. It's not relevant to Uruguay. Uruguay is an exception to the rest of South America. And this is a strong belief that a lot of people have. Um, interestingly, for the sake of this webinar and the public, the audience of this webinar is that anthropologists <clears throat> can't agree on whether there's an indigenous population and quite a few of them and a few of the very famous ones that we have in Uruguay flatly deny they say no there are no Indians in Uruguay that concept doesn't apply there's no such population so it's something that has the anthropologists themselves debating among themselves <clears throat> so I'll see if I can uh, quickly give an idea of what happened uh, up until the 19th century up until independence um, there was a definite indigenous population occupying all of the countryside. Most of the, colon the colonial society was concentrated in the south, in the town, in the port of Montevideo. And there was constant relationships with the Indians, uh, commerce, in the wars. Um, they were hired for certain jobs. Um, there was no problem. But after independence, there was a deliberate intention, a deliberate act from the new government, the new state in the beginning of the 19th century to exterminate the Indians especially those that hadn't accepted uh, acculturation, missionization. So the Indians that were missionized, mostly Warani from the north, 
they were integrated into society, but the ones that did not, the ones that resisted and maintained their independence and autonomy, for example, the Chavrua most famously, um, there was a deliberate intent uh, and action to exterminate them. And that rhetoric of extermination has become very popular and paradigmatic. So most people believe there are no more Indians because they were killed out. But, but that's not true. Uh, empirically, factically not true. Although many of the men were killed in these battles, many of the women and children were taken captive and they were um, given off into the families of the, of the Spaniards um, as servants to be Christianized and acculturated. So they, what happened is with these uh, indigenous women and children, particularly Charruas, for example, they melded into the rural population as low class, low uh, manual labor in the, in the cattle ranches, um, deculturated, forcibly assimilated. Um, and as for the men, most of them were killed off where possible. Some of the boys were acculturated. Some of them remained freely roaming the countryside, but they never re reorganized themselves as a single society or, or transmitted their culture. And many of them fled across the board into Brazil. And in fact, there are recognized Charrua populations now in Brazil, legally recognized by the Brazilian state. Um, but within the borders of Uruguay, up until now, there's no legal recognition and no frontal uh, admission of, of this process. So the situation is that we have very definitely a, a mestizo population with a very high percentage of Uruguayans that have indigenous ancestors, at least, at least about 30%. So this, they are the biggest ethnic minority in Uruguay, the, the mestizos. However, there is no, no kind of policy or politics uh, associated with them. There's no public policy. So this is really strange because if you think about other ethnic minorities like the Afro descendants, who are about 8% of the population, they have affirmative actions, they have policies, they have deliberate um, actions to, to address the historical um, inequalities. But even though the mestizo population, which is the vast majority, the, the largest of the ethnic majorities, one third of the population, there's absolutely nothing. And not only that, there's a denial, an attempt to say, no, um, they don't exist, this doesn't matter, it's not an issue. So since the late 80s, um, some groups of descendants have tried to regain uh, and reclaim the ethnic identity. And that's a problem for the anthropologist because a lot of the anthropologist says, no, you don't have that right, you can't. You're mestizo, so you're not genetically 100% Indian. And your culture, you, you've lost the culture, you're, you share the national culture with everyone else. So you don't culturally also, you cannot uh, claim the identity. So this is a problem because Anthropology then in Uruguay is not decolonized. It's using Western concepts of, of ethnic identity to dismiss the identity claims of a group of people of whom we don't really know what ethnic, what criteria they would have used um, the historically. It's like what ethnic, what criteria would the Charrua have used if they had continued? We don't know it's quite unlikely that they would have used the Western criteria because ethno comparative ethnography of other indigenous groups in, in America, they don't use that criteria, they use other ones. They don't consider descent, you know, genetic descent to be the exclusive criteria or cultural traits that are presumably supposed to be unchanged over the years. It's a very essentialist kind of view of ethnicity that has been used by anthropologists to deny the claims um, for ethnicity. Um, so that's the situation. We don't know if there's an indigenous population. We know for sure that there's a mestizo population. There's no public policy for them. And, and anthropologists cannot agree on what we should do. So there's very little research. There's no ethnography. There's been some uh, interviews with some of the descendants, mostly focused on the claims, not on trying to understand the living conditions of these people, not trying to, not ethnographies in the full sense of the holistic understanding of how, they, how their indigenous ancestry has impacted their structure, their position within the structure of Uruguayan society. And this is the key thing because we can imagine very easily, anecdotally, that these are underprivileged people because they were integrated at the lowest levels of the class of the colonial society. And so they quite likely, we, we, can, we, we can be pretty sure that they would have lower levels of all the indicators of, of development, like uh, health care, education, uh, labor prospects, opportunities for the education. At all of this, they would be at the lowest level. So 
they exist. They're, re with, they're within the Uruguayan structure. They're trying to claim the identity, but anthropologists themselves haven't even made it easy for them. Instead, they've been hostile to their claims. So that's the major things I want to say right now. Thank you very much, Christian. So uh, we have already many, many questions and comments in the chat that you can follow if you go to the chat option. But I will now, before we get in, into that discussion, I will now give the word to our last but not least colleague from Palestine, Sarah Ihmud. And uh, she's last because she's based in the US. So our logic of going from east to west. Uh, Sarah, are you there? I saw you before, so. I know you are, but oh, there you are, <laughs> okay. So I will unmute my microphone and give you the word. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to our colleagues at the WCAA uh, for the invitation to participate in this conversation. I'm so excited to uh, be learning so much about indigenous peoples and indigenous struggles uh, across the globe. Uh, so thank you. I'm honored to be here on behalf of Insaniet, the Society of Palestinian Anthropologists. Uh, just a few words about indigeneity in Palestine. The Palestinian people are an indigenous people who have been resisting a Zionist settler colonial project in historical Pal Palestine for generations uh, since the Nakba, or uh, what Palestinians call the catastrophe in 1948, when 750,000 Palestinians were killed, uh, forcibly displaced or evicted from our homeland. Um, in the creation of the state of Israel. So what are the stakes involved in Palestinians claiming indigeneity, in framing the situation not as a conflict but as an ongoing colonial situation? I think uh, to characterize Israel as a settler colonial project helps us to consider the ways in which various modes of state violence, um, which are still very much ongoing, you know, the theft of our lands and resources, the militarization of our spaces, mass incarceration of our people, uh, restriction of movement, control over our education, healthcare, demolition of our homes, the disavowal of our histories, and so much more are kind of moving parts of a larger machinery that seeks to eliminate us as an indigenous people, to sever our connection to our land and to each other. So understanding Palestinians as an indigenous people facing these larger processes of eliminatory state violence is critical because it has wider implications for how we understand and envision the ongoing struggle for Palestinian liberation, the demands for justice for our people, whether living in the occupied territories, as citizens of the Israeli state or in exile. Um, you know, something that native scholars teach us is that a full engagement with the concept of indigeneity foregrounds the presence of a political collectivity or collectivities whose existence um, and you know, kind of relationship to the land and modes of governance cannot be limited to an internal matter uh, for domestic policy. So that is, you know, we cannot limit our possibilities for understanding the struggle for Palestinian liberation as one that seeks inclusion in a settler state, right? The modes of political organization and expression of indigenous people globally, in many cases, exceed the very form of the nation state. So what I'm saying is that understanding Palestinians as an indigenous people helps us to rethink the dynamics of struggle in Israel-Palestine by opening up possibilities for thinking about uh, political potentials beyond this idea of individualized equality, uh, recognition of us as a minority population within the settler state or other, you know, what have been kind of dominant or hegemonic modes of thinking about Palestinian futures. You know, what is the horizon of redress for Palestinians? What does indigenous sovereignty look like in Palestine? What is the horizon of our collective freedom? These are questions that are um, and must be at the forefront of our imaginations as Palestinian anthropologists today who are engaged in the study of Palestine, which is inherently a political project in the long tradition of uh, what Faye Harrison calls decolonizing anthropology. So I think um, I will stop there for now and give the floor to others to continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, actually, you brought up several of the issues and sub themes that have been discussed in the chat um, for the past uh, almost an hour. 
And um, I will now give the word again to everyone to, you know, to start dialoguing with each other, keeping in mind that many of these issues, for instance, that Sarah just mentioned, are uh, in everybody's minds. And um, uh, so I will go back to the order we had. Uh, we will start again with Indonesia, our colleague Fajar Tufail. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's a, uh, we have a very interesting discussion and also not only um, uh, among the presenters, but also in the chat room. I think it's a, it's, a, it's really a, a interesting uh, dialogue is going on. But I like to, uh, uh, in my second kind of intervention, I like to go back to the point that I uh, uh, made earlier. Uh, with regard to the politics of indigeneity in Indonesia, in which I, I was saying that the, actually the politics of indigeneity of, in Indonesia is it's something that something new, um, and not only among anthropologists but also among uh, uh, rights uh, advocacy groups. And this kind of a talking about ethnic ethnic rights was only possible when the state, uh, the authoritarian state was no longer able to exercise um, its hegemonic power and political control. And the, this kind of situation uh, opened up the uh, possibility of international uh, network uh, having a, a more closer connection to Indonesian uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, advocacy uh, activists. And then I think this is a, a, a very important uh, context that, that, that helped rise the the kind of uh, the 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 politics of indigeneity in Indonesia. So there are the, there are two kind of things of uh, context. One of the, the things is the democratization uh, processes, and the other one is decentralization decentralization of poli uh, 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 pol uh, of politics. And I think this is uh, uh, goes hand in hand with or or kind of um, meeting the uh, the uh, uh, the rising global movement of, 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 of uh, indigenous rights also. So, and also the, uh, in, the, the influential role of the foreign donors uh, can, cannot also be uh, 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 sidelined. I think, I think that there are some kind of, a, uh, kind of a combination of different factors that, that, that allows that the kind of uh, politics of indigeneity becoming stronger in Indonesia. So in 1999, for example, uh, one year after the, the Suarto's, the new authoritarian government collapsed, and uh, the alliance of adept communities or AMAN um, uh, uh, started and it was established. And then this kind of a, a organization marked a new stage in the politics of ethnic right in Indonesia. So this is a the the, the formally the, the 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 ethnic movement was formally very independent. Now it's becoming uh, organized and then and not coordinated as a national organization organization with representation from different different ethnic or adult communities from all over the countries. So this is a uh, the again, but the, the interesting thing is it's going on that the membership of the organizations is contested is very contested category. Because uh, it also reflects the complex complexity that I was uh, talking early, earlier, uh, the organization of of of, of uh, these national uh, 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 indigenous or adult communities do not uh, does not accept member from the Japanese ethnic group or any other the so-called large groups uh, because they define uh, the ethnic groups. These Japanese ethnic groups have no kind of a "Quote unquote indigenous uh, root," and here we can see that different kind of uh, interpretation what indigeneity means uh, as linked to the politics of ethnic rights in post-authoritarian Indonesia. So this kind of a uh, kind of uh, reinterpretation of of, of how uh, what the meaning of indigeneity in Indonesia is very interesting for me, and I think it goes also uh, has a kind of some replication or, or connecting. To other uh, uh, points that, that we can see in, in other other places. So what is really uh, interesting for me is also to in, in order also to look at the kind of a, uh, uh, what do people define uh, as a ethnic groups, and basically what they 
they do and then this is i can the, uh, the 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 role of anthropologists is coming uh, uh, also also coming in the kind of a uh, 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 processes is that the um, the ethnic group is demonstrate is, is defined as a kind of a, as a as a adapt community so for 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 those who are you know um, uh, have heard about adapt it's usually translated as a customary law but uh, i think it, it has a, it is a very uh, uh, different uh, or wider uh, uh, practical use of, of of the term so it's not not only law but it includes some kind of a other kind of a normative uh, uh, values as well so what is really important is that the kind of uh, uh, adat this concept of adat not only refers to the uh, uh, legal norms but also refers to uh, genealogical design and ter- territorial origin so this is kind of a three elements uh, that was becoming the centers of uh, you know uh, kind of politics of ethnic identity in in, in indonesia the one is uh, the adat law and the customary law if you call it that way and also the uh, claim to genealogical design, design and claim to the uh, territorial origin so this is a uh, uh, it's very kind of a colonialistic way of thinking because uh, this is uh, the notion of adat law as you might uh, uh, real uh, know also that actually started uh, by the dutch colonial legal scholars and then it was used by the uh, the uh, political regime in indonesia to define what what uh, uh, adat community was so and then after the 1999 uh, 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 reform reformation period and then decentralization period it was taken by the uh, uh, local uh, the ethnic community and and then they include the notion of genealogical design and also the ter- ter- territorial uh, 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 origin as part of the adat so now adat becoming some some sort some sort of a enlarged uh, category that uh, was used to kind of uh, translate the concept of indigenous uh, indigeneity uh, to Indonesia. So this is uh, the, 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 the situation that, was, that has been going on in Indonesia uh, so far. And then my, my, my question is then, what does it got to do with anthropology and anthropologists in Indonesia? So um, there are two things. The first thing that anthropology now must uh, work closely with sociological scholars, uh, sociological legal scholars to help ethnic uh, ethnic groups reconstructing or conceptualizing their adat laws and their objective is mostly to help the ethnic group to formulate uh, legal justifications for customary claim over land or ownership and this is very important point uh, customary claim over land ownership it's becoming some the the kind of uh, the center of the whole uh, politics of ethnic uh, uh, ethnic rights in, in indonesia and then uh, the second thing is that the next step is then anthropology uh, want to help advocating for the inclusion of the so-called adat law into the state law. So this is uh, the role of anthropologists, not only uh, uh, helping people to define themselves, but also helping people to, to um, uh, uh, in, a, in a legal context, to, to bring this kind of uh, normative uh, category into the state uh, legal categories so this is a uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, central uh, role of anthropologists uh, in Indonesia the second thing is that and this is uh, that I have my own critical reservation and I think it goes uh, also related to the the point uh, in, in the chat room that uh, the anthropologist always holds on to what I call the symbolic in- integrity of adapt norms it means that the, they have to define what kind of a shared norm and what kind of uh, shared norm that becomes the entry point for uh, 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 anthropological intervention in, in, in ethnic movement and ethnic politics. But the problem is that what this kind of uh, intervention by anthropologists misses and what Indonesian anthropology has sac- sacrificed uh, in doing so is that emphasize, uh, in emphasizing and advocating the symbolic integrity of uh, adat norm is actually the kind of a critical perspective that can 
pay closer attention to uh, diverse political interests and complex neg negotiation with within an ethnic group and also ac across any group. So it's kind of a uh, anthropologist uh, in Indonesia now. Now, uh, well, uh, maybe we can call it the going back to the kind of uh, old kind of uh, talking about essentialist uh, this category and things like that. And this is one thing that I see. Uh, uh, going on in Indonesia, that the anthropologists, uh, they whether they like it or whether they realize it or not, it's helping to kind of uh, reinterpret reinterpreting the kind of notion of SM, uh, cultural as a kind of a, in, as a essentialistic uh, uh, category. So this is a uh, uh, my second uh, thought on that point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fajar. So we will follow the original order. Uh, so we will have now uh, Rita Toivonen um, as the second speaker reacting to all that has been said. Rita, are you there? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. Uh, very interesting to listen to you. And it's also very interesting to, to try to follow the chat. I think we would have uh, kind of contents for a week. <laughs> week workshop or so at least um, where it's about the kind of idea of whether anthropology is somehow better or worse off in its studies on indigenous issues and and as I started my own uh, presentation saying that when I was appointed a professor of sustainability science uh, focusing on indigenous uh, sustainabilities uh, I was a bit uh, shocked about that <laughs> to think about what this concept mean and what is actually my job and 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 um, and I must say that I have carried out uh, several um, roundtables on discussing this issue that whether there is something specific to the sustainability of indigenous people. So uh, how should we kind of uh, theorize on that? And um, and uh, but when I read your chat and listen to you, I was thinking that um, at the moment in Finland there is a there is a big discussion about the kind of research ethics. Uh, the Sami people have uh, 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 have a political kind of cultural autonomy, and um, and there has been this kind of uh, proposal that the Sami parliament, which is a political institution, should give the the permission for researchers to do studies on Sami issues. So basically meaning that the polit 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 political institution would decide about science. And I have been very, very uh, critical towards this approach because I think it's uh, very problematic if we had a kind of a, a parliament, a political parliament that would say that research on this topic is not uh, needed or not wanted. And, and now uh, in this kind of work for preparing for some guidelines, uh, some of the very active people from Sami, Sami active people have been uh, kind of referring to uh, Native American uh, deals that they have sometimes that you have to have a permission, for example, to work on, on with, or with some um, First Nation so that something like that should be there. And I've been trying to point out that that for me, science is first of all open. And, and for, for example, in our methods, we always uh, ask for permission of people to participate or, and we try to uh, not come with some hypothesis or ready-made questions when we go and, and do field work, but we try, I think that's in, in the core education of anthropology is that these questions are co-created together with the people we work with, and uh, and 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 therefore this kind of permission uh, would be in many ways problematic. Not only that it would be a kind of political uh, body deciding about free science, but also because uh, the Sami people, like no people, are not just on one homogeneous group having one view, but they have huge political uh, differences. And there is also, as with many indigenous peoples, there is a certain part of the Sami people that the Finnish Sami parliament doesn't recognize as indigenous. So, um, so how to deal with those people who are kind of excluded from this uh, being the 
being the Sami, but who still consider themselves uh, self-identify as Sami. So that uh, I don't know if I have any any concluding. I suppose it's impossible to conclude anything there. But um, but first of all, I think that um, that that uh, as such we have a quite good education as anthropologists to be to to be open and and and, and not give questions from a vote down somewhere uh, on the one side, uh, but we could of course be better. Uh, we nowadays think so much about the ethics in our students, with our students, and, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore I think that um, this kind of permission rule or system, uh, it's yeah in many ways problematic and actually I'm quite curious to hear how it is in our other countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, we will now move on to our third, uh, to our second round, our third speaker, Nigeria. Ugo Chukwu, are you there? I don't know if you have managed to settle your video or you just will just hear you as before, no problem. Hello? Uh, well, I think our colleague from Nigeria is having a connection problem. So let's let's move on to the to the next one and then we'll come back to, to Nigeria. So let's have our colleague from Uruguay, Christian Frenopolo. Ugo, are you there now? Yes, I'm here. Okay, sorry. Okay, so all right. It's just I'm sorry, Christian. So we'll have Ugo first. Okay, uh, please uh, I don't know. Is it by way of intervention to the reactions of uh, the people who are participating on the second question? It's it's as you wish. It's totally informal and open. So there's no specific format. You can react to either some of the comments of our colleagues or to chat or to the initial questions as you wish. Okay. All right. Um, I think uh, I'll uh, retreat uh, my earlier uh, discussion on uh, some explanations that has to uh, do uh, with the uh, indigeneity, which I made mention earlier, uh, within uh, prime modalism, instrumentalism, and uh, constructivism. Yeah, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because uh, the whole of this story play out in my country, okay? Uh, but uh, at the level of uh, indigeneity, I think uh, the challenge has to do with the current structure of uh, governance uh, in the country. Uh, there has been a kind of a ethnic uh, coloration and uh, who gets who and how uh, the natural resources are shared even at the exclusion of those people uh, who uh, uh, the raw material or the materials or the resources are being got from their, their land. And as such, it has uh, created imbalance in the, in the polity, okay? And uh, it becomes uh, a very big uh, controversial thing uh, to think or to ask what is then uh, the place of uh, anthropology uh, in this whole uh, issue. Uh, for the best I know, uh, the ethnic or the major ethnic groups uh, that uh, make up uh, in Nigeria are not contesting whether uh, there are uh, ethnic groups. Of course, there are indigenous groups, okay? But um, the intervention just like I said earlier, on anthropology and anthropological methods in general, has yielded even in understanding more about uh, indigeneity as a concept itself. Uh, for instance, uh, there is um, uh, some, some group who want to align to a particular or a major group for political visibility 
And uh, when this kind of arrangement uh, does not favor them, they will want to reclaim uh, their indigenous uh, uh, status. I'll give you an example. Um, PJZ uh, studied uh, Dioran uh, in uh, Eastern Nigeria. And uh, their position earlier on was that they are part of uh, the Igbo. Okay. And uh, this was, uh, this position is interesting because we are talking about indigeneity. And this is all about uh, protection of identity and uh, to contrast it with uh, other rival groups. But in the case of this uh, Orin, they were actually trying to shade off that identity. In other words, they disclaim that they were indigenous people and wanted to be seen as the Igbo. Uh, because of, uh, because of, because for them, uh, it looks like more effective uh, strategy to gain uh, a political space in a multi-ethnic uh, uh, Nigeria. Uh, but the research uh, found the people as a culturally distinct group. Okay. Um, for instance, the the pre uh, in pre uh, contact time, both groups have a distinct uh, political system. Uh, the Orin uh, had a centralized uh, them with a powerful monarch. Uh, the Igbo uh, was more or less acephalous. It took uh, anthropological fieldwork among them to bring out this, this. It is also apt to know that uh, the group is now reclaiming the identity after uh, they met with futile uh, assimilatory uh, engagement. So uh, we really have it to say that uh, the clamor for uh, uh, indigeneity or identity uh, is majorly uh, politics. And uh, this politics of uh, indigeneity uh, has been uh, creating uh, imbalance uh, in Nigeria are not even doing uh, uh, much more, you know, to alter uh, this uh, narrative. Yeah, because we need more field works. The, the ones uh, that have been done uh, are not uh, representative enough to have given us a fair balance of the indigenous people that make up uh, the current space called uh, Nigeria. And because of this, uh, there has been challenges, uh, you know, generally in terms of uh, governance, in terms of uh, people reacting to who gets who, what and why. Is it because you people are the people who are in power and uh, all that? So uh, for the time being, I think uh, the the currency in this uh, concept uh, is worthy of continual uh, engagement uh, because even if we we'll, uh, look at it from uh, the point of view of uh, knowledge uh, that has to do with adaptation. It becomes obvious that uh, we are playing uh, at the gallery if we have, or if we propose that we have only one solution uh, to problems. Uh, and this is where uh, indigenous knowledge also uh, uh, comes in. Okay, uh, if we have a variety of ways of, uh, you know, attending to social problems, that makes it a very uh, good thing. And anthropologists, uh, ought to be in forefront of uh, not allowing or advocating that uh, these uh, uh, other ways of uh, doing things uh, do not uh, go into extinction. I think uh, I'll uh, uh, stop here for now and then wait as uh,
I wish you all food. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move on to our colleague from Uruguay, Christian Ferranopolo. Okay, hello everyone. Um, all right, I'll say a few things um, in response to some of the things I've seen in the chat, um, which in a sense repeat kind of what I was already going on. So one of them, one of the big questions that people are asking is how to, decon how to decolonize anthropology, because I personally think part of the problem in Uruguay is that, that anthropologists themselves have been denying the issue, uh, coming up with all sorts of arguments, epistemological arguments of why this is not authentic Indians, that they don't have a right to claim the ethnicity, using Western concepts of ethnicity to try and dismiss the claims. So um, decolonization is a big issue, I think, to start with, to start moving this forward, because this debate in Uruguay comes from the 80s. I mean, this is decades that they've not moved. They've been locked into positions, each of the two sides, and anthropologists haven't done very much to, to try and move beyond their own views. So it's not up to them to change. It's up to us to change the way we are looking at this problem. So um, what are some things anthropologists can do? The first one is to renounce the idea that anthropologists are the experts and the only ones to have the monopoly on, on talking about indigenous issues. Because believe it or not, that's what some of the people are saying here. Some of, of, of the colleagues, some of the anthropologists, very explicitly use the, that language. They say they should be listening to us because we are the experts, and they use that word. So that's already a, something to consider. Um, the other one is how the, how the debate has been framed, because the debate has been framed uh, by the anthropologist as an epistemological debate, as if it's an academic debate on how true or how does it match the facts the facts are determined, of course, by the by what Western society, what the Western scientists consider to be facts. So they have the anthropologists themselves don't even see it from the point of view of of the, the claimants. They see it from the from the academic point of view as an academic discussion. So they've been locked into kind of arguments like, "Oh no, you're not really Charrua. You're more probably Warani because there were more Warani at the time living there than Charrua." But that's not. That's not really the issue, I think. That's not what these people are saying. They're not trying to establish whether they are this or this or the kind of details of, of trivial facts. The question is political. It's about voice. The point that these people are trying to make is that they they and their ancestors were denied a voice. They were deliberately suppressed. They were deliberately silenced. And what they're trying to do is regain that voice, reclaim it, have a, be able to say things, be able to present their view, and be able to understand themselves not from the lens of colonialism, because the only um, very most of the information they have about themselves and their ancestors is from the colonial literature and the records. So they, of course, they say a whole lot of things that the anthropologists say, oh, but that's ethnocentric. Well, of course it is, because they're not able to access their own records because they were, they, that was silenced and removed. They, they have to see themselves and come to terms with themselves through the lens of what the colonialists had to say about them. So the whole enterprise is like a, a, a vicious circle. And, and the anthropologist, I think it's up to the anthropologist to stop this, to cut this, and to realize that the point is voice, not epistemological truth of authenticity. Um, how to help them? And they've approached the anthropologist, and of course, we're, we're turned back. Um, so part of the way, I think, to help them is, is it's OK for anthropologists to present knowledge and, and the truths that anthropologists might have to have. But there's a big difference between teaching and sharing and, on the other hand, pontificating and seeing yourself as superior and expert. There's a difference in that attitude. And I think anthropologists have too much been on the side of pontificating and not really sharing um, our knowledge. Um, some people also ask about the... Um, some people also ask about the politi electoral politics and political parties and how that plays into this, because certainly it's true that in other parts of Latin America, that's a big issue too. Um, in Uruguay, none of the political parties have wholeheartedly committed to the issue. They all kind of have this ambiguous kind of, we're aware of the issue, we agree in principle, but they don't take any practical measures to really do it. There's only been some sort of more symbolic kind of recognitions, like declaration of 11th of April as the, as the day of the Indians, because that was the day of the, the most notorious massacre. Um, but that doesn't come any, with any kind of additional empirical uh, support. It's just the day has been declared, you know. Um, 
And for example, one of the one of the um, heroes, one of the war heroes of the independence was in was buried. His remains were buried together with the war hero, the Kriyoj, or the, the, the white war heroes. OK, fair enough. But again, this is like more symbolic than actually really giving empirical support to these people who are structurally positioned in society at the lowest and most disadvantaged levels. Um, so politi politics have not done very much to, to side themselves with the issue. In fact, they sort of tend to kind of push it forward or push it away as something, you know, we agree in principle, but they don't actually really take much measures. That, I think, is another thing anthropologists can do. There's very little research on these people. Like I say, there's no, no whole field work. Um, nobody really knows very well exactly how they're living, how they're disadvantaged, what are the consequences in the present of having an indigenous ancestor. Very little of this is known because anthropologists have been too caught into discussing the authenticity of the claims rather than just saying, look, you know, we, we recognize their mystique, so let's see how they live now and how this affects them. Um, and the, the bottom line of the discussion is to what extent can a mestizo be considered indigenous? And I don't think it's up to anthropologists to make that decision. It's not the job of anthropologists to go around classifying people and deciding who is or who isn't part of each category. That's the first, that's one of the first things you need to do to decolonize anthropology. Stop, um, stop be considering yourself the expert on classifying other people and denying their own classifications for how they stand. Okay, so I'll stop here. All right, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, we will now go to um, Sara Ihmut uh, from Palestine once again. Sara? And then the questions that folks are raising in the chat. Um, I want to talk a little bit about. Oh, sorry, Sara, can, can you um, start again? Because in the beginning, I think you were on mute, so we couldn't hear you. No worries. Thank you, Fleta. Um, I, I was just saying I'm, I'm enjoying the discussion and I'm also uh, loving the questions in the chat around kind of decolonizing anthropology and, you know, questions of indigeneity and so much more. Um, so I wanted to address some of these questions in relation to a question that Coletta posed at the outset about fieldwork among indigenous communities, um, you know, and the kind of political implications of field work in Palestine. So I wanna talk a little bit about what that means um, for Palestinian anthropologists. Uh, the conditions of Israeli settler colonialism shape our very ability as Palestinian anthropologists, whether we're based in our homeland or in exile to conduct field work among our people. Uh, both our colleagues and students at Palestinian universities and other scholarly institutions based in the occupied territories, for instance, are constantly facing the challenges of military occupation. Um, they face systematic closures imposed by military authorities, uh, severe limitations around the ability to collaborate among institutions and among scholars, uh, due both to Israeli militarization of space and restrictions on Palestinian movement, you know, the imposition of a system of checkpoints, the apartheid wall, and so on and so forth, and the attempts uh, by Israeli authorities to censor and restrict knowledge production about Palestine. And this is to say nothing of the challenges faced by Palestinian students, um, including you know, students of anthropology uh, in the occupied territories to even access their educational institutions. So that's one layer, right? The challenges imposed on educational institutions and the very right to education, which includes anthropology um, by the, the political conditions of, of military occupation. Another layer of these challenges um, is navigating the histories and conditions of surveillance and control that our interlocutors face while conducting field work. You know, how do we cultivate relationships of trust in a situation where our communities are facing overwhelming modes of surveillance uh, imposed by the state, where there's a justified fear of uh, state violence and political repression? I think these are, you know, important questions that that uh, are central to what we consider while, while conducting field work. For those of us living in exile in the Palestinian diaspora who wish, who wish to reach Palestine to conduct field work, we face yet another layer of challenges in the very attempt to access the field, right? When we reach the Israeli border, um, we're interrogated by Israeli authorities at length. Uh, our very access to the field is not something that we can take for granted as members of a colonized population, right? 
because we're seen as the other, we're seen as a threat to the state. Um, and I can tell you that many of my colleagues, Palestinian anthropologists of many generations have been denied entry to the occupied territories uh, by Israeli authorities and have faced severe challenges in even the ability to conduct field work among our people in Palestine. And then there's the issue of, you know, Israeli attempts to repress knowledge production about Palestine. And of course, this takes varying forms in various global contexts, but in the United States, where I'm currently based, for instance, uh, there's severe censorship on Palestine in the US Academy. Um, I'm not sure if you all are aware, I've been following the conversation on this, but in December 2019, uh, Donald Trump signed an executive order directing government agencies, including the US Department of Education, to consider um, a definition of anti-Semitism that was very distorted, uh, designed to further censor free speech on Palestine after you know, various failed attempts to pass similar legislation in Congress. So this is something that is used against Palestinian scholars. Um, you know, I myself have faced this kind of distorted definition of, of anti-Semitism as a way to um, kind of censor speech on Palestine. Um, this order has emboldened Israel's allies to further attack scholars to further attack students, institutions, and others engaged in speaking out against Israel's violation of Palestinian rights, right? So there's this severe context of surveillance and repression of Palestinian speech in many countries, including the United States. Um, so there are these challenges and restrictions imposed on us as Palestinian anthropologists who conduct fieldwork in Palestine because of our positionality as indigenous peoples in a context of an ongoing project of settler colonialism. Um, you know, how do we face these challenges? What do we do in the face of this context, right? Um, where there are challenges, I think there always uh, is space for methodological innovation. And I think that that's something hopeful that we're seeing today. We're seeing Palestinian anthropologists developing innovative methodological tools for approaching, you know, the very idea of fieldwork in Palestine. What does fieldwork look like um, that kind of you know, seeks to, uh, you know, subvert or, you know, find other ways of, of accessing the field, right? Um, on this note, you know, I also see quite a few references to Linda to Hugh I. Smith in the chat, and I want to lift her up in this conversation and express solidarity with her because her work has been so critical and such an inspiration um, and a gift to so many of us working with Indigenous communities. You know, one of the things I always think about in relation to anthropology of Palestine is her wisdom in decolonizing methodologies. You know, she says at one point, um, quote, non-Indigenous research has been intent on documenting the demise and cultural assimilation of Indigenous peoples. Instead, it is possible to celebrate survival or what Gerald Weisner has called survivance, right? Survivance and resistance. Survivance accentuates the degree to which Indigenous peoples and communities have retained cultural and spiritual values and authenticity in resisting colonialism, right? I'm raising this particular quote because I think it speaks to something that we're witnessing in the contemporary moment as well. Um, and that is, uh, you know, anthropological knowledge production on Palestine that is attending to indigenous ways of knowing that have traditionally been excluded, marginalized or denied, right? There's an attentiveness to how we understand Palestinian survival and resistance and how that in turn affects how we envision Palestinian futures. Um, Native feminist scholar Mishwana Goman asked us to consider how do we uproot settler colonial social and material maps that inform our everyday experiences, right? And she suggests that the aim here is not so much to, uh, quote, regain that which was lost, right? Um, and returning to an original time before the imposition, imposition of the settler colonial project, but as a way of interrogating our ever-changing native epistemologies that frame our understanding of land and our relationship to it and to other peoples, right? How do we think about this idea of remapping in relation to Palestinian sovereignty? How do we as anthropologists choose to explore and narrate Palestinian life and survival in the contemporary moment? How do we move beyond the Israeli settler colonial narrative beyond the restrictions imposed on our very ability to imagine decolonial alternatives, you know, futures in Palestine. These are some of the challenges and possibilities I think um, that face us as Palestinian anthropologists. And I think that this idea of reclaiming our narrative of Palestinians and reclaiming our very permission to narrate um, as Edward Said called it back in 1984 is something that is inherently tied to 
you know, what a project of decolonizing anthropology might look like in Palestine today. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so uh, we have gone through everyone uh, twice. I will now just uh, briefly um, make a, a summary of some of the questions and comments, which anyway have been already picked up by the participants. We've had, like many of you have mentioned, we have had a very active chat here on the side with people commenting, asking questions, answering each other, etc. Questions went from the beginning, from the, the issue of uh, the relationship between indigenous, native, original, autochthonous people and minorities, and the definitions uh, given in the various places for, for all these uh, issues of terms used or words or concepts and their um, meaning from a political, social, social perspective. And then, of course, in the chat, as Sarah and others have just mentioned, uh, I think in the chat we've all gone to a very um, important aspect of all these uh, issues, which is the lingering of colonial attitudes and practices of othering, and um, and the fact that anthropology has yet to be decolonized, which is something that has also been discussed on the site, and the relationship of anthropology with other sciences, such as, for instance, political science and the legal rights of indigenous people, which is something that ev almost everybody has touched upon. And then uh, finally, last but not least also, it was Muggsy, I think, that mentioned that um, all this discussion about indigeneity uh, has directly to do with politics, of course, with contemporary anthropology and politics, as we have seen in all the comments. And uh, I just want to remember, you, you know, to remember here and, and um, emphasize that what we did this time is we asked the delegates worldwide. Uh, we gave several um, themes for the next webinar and we made them vote. And this one won. And, and contemporary politics and anthropology, as Carmen Hill, the president, also wrote in the chat, was right next to it. So we just, we didn't, it was not the committee deciding, we just followed the majority opinion. And so we we are having uh, indigeneity today, but the next webinar would for sure be on contemporary politics and anthropology. And of course, both are connected as we can see from the discussion today, both online on the chat and um, what we hear here, they are connected. You cannot disconnect the problems of indigenous people and the role of anthropology from ethical and political issues. Uh, and so, uh, of course, indigen indigeneity is a political loaded term. Uh, and, and, and I think that's very, that comes very uh, straightforward in all the discussion on the chat. So um, I now open the floor to discussion. So now there is no uh, specific order. Please, um, any of the participants who wants to be next and comment either on each other's comments or on the chat, all the issues have, have come up, please feel free to do so. Wants to be first. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I'll go first. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I kind of a, kind of a, uh, provoked by the, the point that Christian raised, uh, of, uh, not only in, in terms of decolonizing and anthropology, but also in terms of the uh, giving voice to the uh, so-called, you know, whatever you call it, in, in indigenous community or ethnic community or local community. But the, the point that you raised that, the, well, as an anthropologist, then we have to give them the right to, 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 to speak. And, and this is a political because, you know, when you, when you, uh, she's a kind of a, uh, what I call it, it probably also related to the question of ethics, yeah, but, but, the, the 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 problem that I have that I kind of am wondering uh, uh, about that kind of a particular uh, uh, issue is that uh, and I also uh, put in in chat room that to whose voice that we we have to to learn or to listen to listen to because this is this is uh, coming out of my my um, uh, experience, you know, working with the indigenous or the, any communities in Indonesia, that there are so many, many uh, 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 also political contestation. There are so many um, kind of uh, political interests among the community itself. 
So when we kind of uh, just sit back and kind of uh, give the rights to uh, the others, put it that way, to speak, and then you know, as an anthropologist, that uh, our task is just to give it, to prepare a kind of venue, to prepare a kind of a place or anything for people to speak. And then the question that comes to my mind is that you know, uh, whose voice that we 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 will be privileged and by having doing nothing i think it's also kind of a, a problem in itself because you allow that some you know ad, other processes is going on you know uh, that's the, the the indigenous community is not it's not a kind of a, a you know uh uh bounded and neutral so there there are so many kind of a politics there are so many kind of interests also going on within that not not only the the uh, the the whole you know concept, but also within that particular community. So I think this this kind of just just kind of a wondering uh, uh, if Christian can you know kind of uh, clarify or maybe elaborate a little bit on that point. Thank you. Uh, may I say something in <laughs> before Christian? Of course, there's no there's no order. Yeah. So I was just. To starting to write it in the chat, but maybe I can say it aloud also about this, what you spoke about the theme, the polit polit politic political issue on this uh, whole giving the voice and to whom to listen. That, uh, of course, uh, this kind of indigenous or indigeneity is a kind of voc vocabulary that comes from international human rights law. So it has in it a kind of uh, idea of emancipation and, and uh, giving the voice, yeah, uh, but at the same time, people are, of course, not born as indigenous, they are born as human beings, and this kind of being indigenous in a certain political way is something that they learn uh, either in the family or in, in the school, or maybe they learn it only when they are much older and they start to think about this, uh, about their life in terms of this kind of uh, indigeneity. So therefore, I think it's um, there are many parts that are uh, interesting and difficult, as we see in this chat, for example, this issue of voice. So there are many indigenous people who still don't have any voice because they have never thought about themselves in this kind of global legal indigeneity structure. So, um, but then again, there are others who very much uh, kind of ha have reconstructed the kind of colonial past and and maybe even uh, kind of uh, invented part of that colonial past in order to make the right argument to be listened by the right people in the right uh, places like the UN Permanent Forum for Indigenous Issues that kind of requires from people a certain kind of being in order to be recognized as indigenous in these uh, regimes. So there are, for an anthropologist, so many layers to be studied. It's not that you are studying in a, in a village uh, by the fire people, but actually you are also traveling to New York and, and to the UN headquarters and, and, and everything in between. So it's a very, very large field for for an anthropologist to cover and all of these places and spaces of course need a bit different kind of methodologies of of learning but also of analyzing yeah that's what i wanted to say <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much Rita. Rita, okay. uh, who's okay. talking now okay um please uh, Hugo Chuku, yeah 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 something i would uh I want to uh, probably get clarification um, from, you know, uh, most of uh, the people uh, who spoke uh, kept talking about uh, decolonizing uh, anthropology. Uh, most, uh, most of us here, uh, we know the role uh, anthropology uh, played uh, in colonizing us. And uh, because of uh, this role, uh, there has been issue with even anthropological knowledge production uh, in Nigeria uh, for the obvious reason that people are thinking or arguing that uh, there is no need uh, to continue uh, with the course that even uh, uh, was the thing that was used 
as an instrument uh, of uh, colonization. And as such, whenever you talk about anthropology, people uh, react to it from uh, that particular uh, angle. Uh, the question is, are we supposed to be voice of uh, the people we study? Or are we supposed uh, to present them to the world as a subordinate uh, uh, entity? Uh, it uh, also beats my mind that um, I need clarification from wider audience about uh, uh, this. And then in terms of uh, field work, um, there has been a lot of uh, indigenous uh, uh, field work going on. Uh, most of the works uh, done in Nigeria during the uh, colonial period are still uh, uh, remarkable. But those work uh, those works or those uh, studies we are not uh, able uh, to capture uh, in its entirety the different uh, uh, ethnic groups uh, that uh, make up uh, Nigeria. I just cited one uh, particular instance where Oren uh, was studied by an indigenous uh, anthropologist. Uh, but then this Oren, if you mention, you, 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 you think uh, that because uh, this, the researcher and then uh, probably the area uh, are grouped under one place, the researcher has not been there throughout his life. Uh, the researcher doesn't know the language of these uh, people. In short, he had, uh, he and his group had to uh, do what a foreigner uh, a foreign anthropologist should actually do uh, in the field. Do we classify this as a, a indigenous anthropology, or indigenous anthropological knowledge production, or do we also treat it uh, from the point of view of, of uh, uh, the other? Uh, myself also, uh, I did my own uh, field work among uh, the Rubo, which I uh, believe to be uh, classified in the same cultural area with myself. But uh, little did I know that what I thought was obvious uh, was never obvious. Uh, for instance, we, we, uh, women, uh, who major, majority of the people are seen from that side as uh, the subordinate order, and then advocating maybe for, for voice, we are actually the people who are conserving uh, whatsoever is the thing that uh, uh, is being used against them. So when we do field work, we'll be able to understand this from uh, the oh, level oh, of- sorry. Can you please wrap up? Because we need to give voice to everyone. So I, you should sorry? not really take much longer than a few minutes in it. Awesome. Oh, thank, thank you, you please. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ugu. Ugu Chuku. I'm sorry. It's just that, you know, uh, the reason I, I asked everyone to not talk for more than four or five minutes each time is just to give, you know, a space for everyone. So who, who wants to go next? We're, we're already, we've been here for one hour, 45 minutes. So we'll have shortly, you know, like, we have like 10, 15 minutes the most because the webinar should not really move, go on for more than two hours. So please, Christian, thank yes. you. Yes, okay, so I'll try and um, answer some of the questions that people have been asking, if I can. Um, so Fajar asks, whose voice should we listen to? Because he makes the important point that communities are not necessarily homogenous in their ideas uh, and who are their representatives. And that's definitely a case of, of Uruguay. There's a very small numerical popular uh, group of people that are politically active. They're not very, they don't, they're not in that much agreement among themselves. They're quite anarchic in the sense that they sort of, uh, they reinforce constantly this idea of independence and resistance and, uh, and uh, being ourselves and autonomy. So that, that they reproduce that political thing that they attribute to the Charrua among themselves. Um, and then there's an enormous proportion of people who are 
entirely unaware of, uh, or don't care or, or just entirely unaware of their indigenous ancestry and they're completely they're, they're not raising their voice towards anyone because they don't know they don't care it doesn't seem to be an issue for them um so who should we listen to i think is we should listen to everyone as anthropologists we definitely have to listen to the people who are politically active um, and we need to take very seriously their claims some of their claims at face value make a lot of sense um, so for example in the case of the political active they make three basic claims one of them is uh, the dispossession of the land as Rita was saying as a definition uh, the fact that, that that they lived here before the white the, the Europeans came and, and then they were gradually pushed off their own land the other one is the violence that they were subjected to the genocide the genocidal attempts the the the, the massacres the enforced servitude um the enforced assimilation so another one that they claim is the violence and there's another claim that they bring up which is betrayal because they for various in various different in various different events they were promised things from the from the colonial society or from the independence leaders uh, the military and then betrayed um, that includes the, the actual genocidal acts themselves, where they were mis they were um, purposefully misled that this that they would have this great big meeting, and then with that, and they were disarmed, and then they were attacked, uh, they were ambushed. So, and then, but there's other ways of betrayal as well that that are recorded. For example, much of the Warani population, there's a lot, there's a, an enormous amount of Warani population that came down from the from the missions, the Warani missions. Uh, uh, when they when the Maranish missions were disbanded, they were brought into to what is now Uruguay, where they were set up in towns and settled, and then they were basically abandoned. Basically, they they some of their goods were were confiscated and and just left to themselves. So the promises of rebuilding their society on what is now Uruguay were not fulfilled. Um, so that's one thing to, to consider. The other one is the people who, who were very much unaware of their indigenous ancestry because there's a big national narrative of trying to deny the indigenous past and deny that that, that past has continued into the present and has effects in the present. So that's another group of people who don't even see themselves as having something to claim, like uh, Rita was saying, some indigenous people don't recognize themselves as such. Um, Carmen asked the question of, of how this seems strange in the context of Uruguayan politics, which is very liberal, generally speaking, for South America. She mentions the case of abortion and legalization of marijuana, and, uh, marriage equality. There's a number of things that make, has always made Uruguay a very liberal society. But that might be one of the reasons why there is a denial of, of indigeneity, because it goes against this, this strong intended uh, rhetoric that Uruguay is a homogenous, advanced, civilized, liberal society, which they so, which the the founding fathers of the country so much tried to to implement uh, forcefully at some times. So that's one possibility. It goes, it, it, it denies that that narrative. It makes it say no. Actually, actually, the country was built upon war and betrayal and genocide. It kind of goes against what they're trying to say. Um, and the whole Masonic view of Uruguay as, as this land of freedom and equality and brotherhood. Um, another big issue is the land, rep the reparations, historical reparations, which again, no one wants to frontally admit. There is a, there is a sense that if, if the state comes to terms with its indigenous population or descendants, that they will immediately claim uh, reparations. So for now, Uruguay doesn't sign any of the international treaties on indigenous peoples, for example. And that's something that the, some of the groups are saying, you've got to sign them, everyone else is signing them. But of course, the problem is the, 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 the economic consequences of admitting that this population exists. Um, and then another issue would be, of course, the, the, the revisionism that it would imply of the political parties, because Uruguay has another unusual situation in that it's ruled by parties that have very much been the same ones right since the beginning. These are some of the oldest surviving political parties in the world, um, run by the same families that, you know, the, the, the father and the grandfather and then the uncle, they were all presidents and they were all occupying high positions. So to admit this dark side of the Uruguayan history will immediately require a strong revisionism of these parties that have tried to establish themselves as as leaders in, in, in the, you know, the French Revolution type of, of, of republic that they tried to create here. Um, so uh, when Rita, Rita asked in the chat, um, are some voices silenced by the fact that other people are regaining their voice? 
Well, because this isn't much of, any, of, a, of a public debate because of this strong belief that there's no such thing as an indigenous population and that the descendants don't really matter because they were all assimilated, um, the vast numerical majority of people are unaware. So the silent voices will be the people who are unaware of their indigenous or don't care about their indigenous ancestry. So there is a risk that, that the debate will be led only by that small group of people that are more active. Um, that doesn't mean I don't think we should, I think we still have to listen to them to what they're saying, because aside from the factual things that they say about, you know, the genocide and the violence and the dispersion of the land, there's also some metaphorical issues that they might be bringing up in their claims, because they tend to attract around them uh, people who have this sort of alternative alternative views of, of society, like uh, ecological uh, sustainability, alternative economic order, you know, different from capitalism, different from a class society. They're very anarchic. Um, so, so maybe their claims are also related to an alternative narrative, that, that an alternative utopia that they're trying to uh, put forward. They use indigeneity as the emblem to um, uh, to um, what's the word to to engulf all these other anti-Western, anti-capitalism, anti-nationalism, uh, hege hegemonic uh, discourses. So I think, as analysts, as anthropologists, we need to look at that as well. Not just at the things that they say at face value, but also what are the, what's the undercurrent that they're also maybe trying to say that the language they're using is the language of indigeneity to say these other things. We would like to live in a Uruguayan society that is different, that is not seen as homogenous, liberal, uh, uh, you know, um, white, egalitarian. Maybe they want to bring other values to the, to the front, and they use the language of indigeneity as the language with which to express these other ideas. As for the, for the group that is silent and unknown and unaware, which are numerically the majority, in that case, we obviously don't need to give them a voice, but we can provide the conditions for it. But what we can do as anthropologists is study the effects of indigenous ancestry on their um, current situation, like contextually, how are they positioned? We don't know. The, is the health, what's the health status? What's the education status? What are the job opportunities? Because most of these people are rural. Most of the people are lower class. Um, so structurally, they're in a dis quite likely, we will find out if we start researching this, that they're in a very disadvantaged position. So we can address that without necessarily instigating uh, indigeneity as an identity. Oh, and another thing we need to do, just to, to wrap up, is we can reread, we can and we should reread um, and reanalyze the academic discourses itself, like as we are academic we need to ask ourselves, have we been interpreting the, the, our sources in the right, in the only way? Um, because, for example, taking at face value ethnicity label is itself questionable because the, our comparative ethnography of how ethnicity is, is uh, attributed in other cultures, we know that, that not necessarily the Western way of doing it is the way they were doing it. So when we read this, these historical documents where they write, the Charrua this, or if we read the church records of baptisms where they attribute the person who was writing the baptism record writes, this is a charrua baby from a charrua mother. What exactly does that mean? Can we take it at face value? How did they attribute ethnicity at the time? Because if there was already a mixing mestizage already going on at the time, how were those babies attributed to one or the other? When were they written down as Indians and when were they written down as, as Spanish? We need to know this too. We need to go back also to the sources and read them with a decolonial mind as well, not taking for granted how Westerners nowadays would consider those concepts. Okay, I'll stop here. All right, Christian, thank you so much. So since we have um, we have really do the, the whole round uh, and we have respected the order in the third round, I'll give the word to Sarah now for uh, some final remarks. Thank you. Wow, okay, this is really difficult to have some final remarks, uh, but I'll keep them very brief. Uh, you know, I'll just say this, uh, you know, thinking about Palestine as an indigenous rights issue has implications, uh, not only for thinking about Palestinian collectivity and peoplehood and, you know, Palestinian futures, but for this question of, you know, how do we engage with indigenous collectivities and peoples more broadly across the world, right? Um, in one sense, there's a way in which the historical and contemporary struggles of Palestinians um, 
comes to serve as a kind of prism through which to view other political struggles. And that's been a case that we've seen um, in many contexts. You know, the struggle for Palestinian liberation has always had a deep engagement and solidarity with transnational black and indigenous people struggling for self-determination. You know, people struggling against racism and state violence in a number of global contexts. Um, I think by the very nature of Israeli settler colonialism being an imperial project that has inherited uh, global logics of race and racism among other things. And the extent to which Israel has used Palestine as a sort of laboratory, a sort of captive population for developing technologies of militarization and surveillance uh, that have been exported to police and to, to police and control indigenous and other marginalized populations around the world. Um, it's imperative that we as Palestinian anthropologists continue to build connections with other indigenous peoples um, and their allies. And it's imperative that we engage deeply with the study of colonial power and also indigenous modes of resistance um, in various global contexts. So I'll leave it there since we're short on time, but I just wanna thank our colleagues for sharing all that they've shared uh, for the participants for their thoughtful questions and, uh, and to you know, our colleagues for organizing this forum. And I hope that we can continue this discussion in other ways. Thank you very much, Sarah. So yes, we are almost still getting to two hours of webinars, so we do have to stop here. And I want to thank everyone once again, uh, the participants who spoke here, but also everyone who contributed in the chat. Once again, I remind you that the webinar will be posted on the website, not immediately, but within the next few days, also the chat. And I think this has been a really terrific uh, webinar. And of course, it has raised a lot of questions, which are impossible to answer in the time span of two hours, of course. But hopefully, like Mugsy uh, suggested, in the next webinar on politics and contemporary anthropology, we will uh, go back and address some of these issues that have to do with uh, ethnicity uh, related to politics and to uh, the world we live in nowadays. Thank you very, very much uh, to everyone. Stay safe and we'll hopefully see you again in the next uh, webinar next month. Thank you so much. Bye.